Welcome back, everybody, to the monthly EVH webinars. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, uh, MD, Dr. Tim Fjord, who's been practicing homeopathy in Illinois for, what, two, 25 years, 30 years? 30 years. 30 years, 30 years. wow. With um, Dr. Shepard, who we've heard from before, and today, Dr. Fior, who is the leader for the United States uh, Material Medical Product, is also going to talk to us a little bit about the Material Medical Project, which is designed to help expand um, our knowledge of the remedies. And today he'll be launching into his his uh, consolidation. Well, you know what? I'll let Tim explain what it's all about. So, Tim, take it away. Thank you. All right, Jeff, thank you very much. And uh, everyone, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, Jeff and I have been uh, participating in this Materia Medica PER project for about 10 years now. And um, it's uh, really a great thing. So uh, when Jeff asked me to do this presentation, he asked if I would give a, a kind of a introduction to the what we call the MMPP or the Materia Medica PER project. And also to do one of the remedies, which I prepared for this. Um, it's a little over 100 page uh, monograph, which will cover the highlights of uh, ferrum phosphoricum. So um, without further ado, let's let's get to it. Um, so the question comes up, well, why would you even want to do this? Um, anyone who's familiar with the homeopathic material medica, you realize that basically this same effort, what we're doing in the MMPP was already done but in the late 1800s. Um, Allen's Encyclopedia of Pure Materia Medica, um, volume one was published 1874, the last volume in 1879. And, and that I'm, was, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Tim, but what is it that you're doing? <clears throat> that we're, you know, we're, we're doing this, but what is it exactly that you guys in the Materia Medica project are doing? Uh, well, that's what, that's what I'm gonna explain here. So, um, you know, that was the last time that all the provings were put together. And then Herring, after that, he published uh, the Guiding Symptoms, which was not only provings, but also clinically confirmed symptoms. But since then, there's a lot of information that sits in journals from the 1800s until today that basically no one knows about. There's toxicology reports, provings, experience, cured cases, and basically, in the Materia Medica Pro project, what we're doing is we're going back in. There's two phases to it. One phase is we're going back to the old literature and indexing it. And then people like myself are assigned different remedies to go back and look at everything that's in Allen and Herring and Hahnemann and then add all the cases, all the confirmations from the old literature from you know the 1800s until today. So the purposes of the MMPP, what we're doing is some people are just indexing journals. We're always looking for new people. If anyone's interested in helping with this, you're certainly welcome to. Um, we're creating monographs of the top 500 plus remedies. And the monographs basically consist of a short description of the substance, which we'll see with Ferrum Foss, and then a listing of all, all the characteristic symptoms from reliable sources up to date, and then a list of all the cases that are available in the literature from the beginning, from the first provings onward. And with this, we create a genius of the remedy. And sometimes um, this is already known, but sometimes uh, the genius that we come up with is something that it's, it's kind of in the literature, but no one's really aware of it. And so this is a useful part of, of the project, probably one of the most useful parts, because once you understand the genius of a remedy, when we're trying to prescribe, when we're repertorizing or you know referencing Materia Medica, oftentimes we're having a few key symptoms that we're looking for. And if those few key symptoms match one of the remedies or the genius of one of these remedies, you have to consider it in the repertorization. And then all this information, some of it's already in the repertory, but a lot of it is being added to the repertory. In the case of Ferrum Foss, I added over a thousand additions to the repertory. And hopefully this in the in the long run will improve our prescribing accuracy. I can tell you from my own experience, the remedies that are in the, the MMPP, because of the MMPP repertory that's available to us and because of the MMPP monographs, 
I've been prescribing remedies like plumbum, nitric acid, ferrum fos, asafetida, other remedies, much more than I ever would have without, without this project and with good effect with patients. Um, so it's been going over 10 years. Already 150 remedies have, have been updated, about 50,000 additions. They're making thousands of additions per year. Um, for example, with plumbum metallicum, uh, there are over 3,000 additions. Nitric acid heparsol, about 1,500. For ferrumfos, like I said, about 1,000. You can look at these monographs. Um, Whole Health Now um, has, this is Kim Alia's website, has um, these two remedies, Trillium, which is an interesting remedy. It's a plant uh, remedy which has a feeling like uh, the parts are separating, like it has bleeding and feeling like the hips are, or the, 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 the pelvis is, is like separating. Um, and then Quasia, which is a, which is a plant remedy um, from South America. It's similar to, has some similarities to arsenicum and cinchona. So those, the complete monographs are available um, at that website. Whole Health Now. Now in Synergy, the idea is um, in McRepertory to make um, the repertory editions eventually available, We're still working on that. Um, also to make the various monographs available in reference works. And these are the ones that are already available in reference works. So if you have reference works, uh, and you've gotten the recent updates, you should have these. You can search through these monographs and you'll see the one we're doing today. Everything I'm giving you today is on the Ferrum Foss monograph in reference works. Other remedies that I personally worked on are Mangifera, which is mango, which interestingly enough, uh, uh, it has urethriol in it. So it's very similar to rust tox. And uh, after doing the monograph, uh, I've had a few patients who uh, have responded well to it. I can think of one uh, young Indian boy who uh, had asthma and he responded very well to Mangifera for a while. Um, another one I've done is Tilia Europea, um, the linden tree. Um, this is useful for like people who have uh, fevers and things like that and they sweat, but the sweat doesn't give them any relief. Um, of course, ferrum which we'll talk about today. Asafetida, which is a remedy with a lot of belching and Everything's kind of coming from inside out. This is one of the one of the genius fa uh, issue uh, aspects of this of this remedy. So actually, going through this process and putting together a monograph, you really learn a lot about a remedy, and you learn about how the material medica is constructed, uh, clinical confirmation, and how the repertory is constructed. And you realize that a lot of what's in the literature is not in the repertory. So let's talk about fair and false. Are there any, any questions about any of that? Uh -huh. okay. I thought I heard someone say something. Nothing uh nothing from the from the others. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, let's start on ferrum, ferrum phosphoricum. Mm -hmm. Everyone recognizes ferrum phos. It's one of the Schusler, the 12 Schusler remedies. Uh, in fact, um, Schussler, you know, homeopathy is difficult. And so the history of homeopathy is littered with uh, attempts by various authors to, and homeopaths to come up with a simpler system. Well, Schussler's system of the 12 tissue remedies is one such system. He said, basically, if you, uh, I think if you take uh, like human tissue or something and burn it, and, and you end up with these 12 tissue remedies or these salts in, in the, in the ash and that, that should be all you need to cure someone. Well, obviously that's overly simplistic and not true, but he did, uh, as a result of the system, he evolved um, the 12 tissue remedies of which ferrum Foss is one, and uh, it's a very valuable remedy. Sometimes it will work wonders when it's indicated. Um, so what is ferrum phosphoricum? It's iron phosphate or ferrosoferric phosphate. It's a combination of probably iron plus two and iron plus three in the both oxidation states. So it's a hydrated form of the two oxidation states. It's a blue-green powder. And it's interesting, one of the indications for ferrum phosphoricum is in tuberculosis, and I have experience with one patient uh, with uh, tuberculosis type syndrome. Um, and one of the characteristics is it, it's a, it's a blue-gray powder when you make it. and 
uh, one of the indications is when people cough up, the sputum is blue gray. So there probably there's some ferrum foss in the, in the sputum. It's made by mixing iron sulfate and sodium sulfate. It's the precipitate is washed. It's a blue, bluish gray. Um, and again, bluish, the bluish pus from people with, um, with um, uh, phthisis, which is uh, t t tuberculosis, probably has a ferrum foss in it. Uh, it was introduced by Schussler in 1974 um, without any provings. Uh, so this is what we call a remedy by breach delivery. Uh, I don't know if in veterinary medicine that's such a big thing. Like in in in, uh, in you know human medicine, uh, breach deliveries are the OBs always sweat because it's much more complications. And in fact, when a remedy is is first used clinically before there are provings, it creates complications. And the complications are that oftentimes the remedy can only be used by clinical indications, so like fever, this, that, without a lot of individualizing symptoms. And that's true of basically all the Schussler salts, except for silica and natremur, which were brought, Schussler brought into his um, uh, cell salts without, they were already part of homeopathy and had already been proven. But all the other basically uh, Schussler remedies were brought into uh, use without provings, and then they were proven later. So 74, he brought it in, um, into use, and Morgan did a proving in 1876, and then Moffat reproved it in 1887, 88. Uh, I also found a proving uh, Jurgen Becker, Becker in, uh, in 91. It was a seminar proving, a dream proving. Um, these I consider unreliable because they have lots of dream symptoms and not a lot of other symptoms. It's kind of an unbalanced proving, and probably also it was unblinded. So it's not, you know, if you tell someone you're going to give them wolf's milk or something like that in approving, uh, you're going to probably going to get a lot of people dreaming about about wolves and things like that. And that's not necessarily because of the substance; it's because of the suggestion from telling them what it is. And we want it. We you know that's not what we want in homeopathy. Um, so um, Schusler used the ferric phosphate, and also Moffat used the ferrum, the ferric phosphate. Morgan said he proved the ferrous phosphate, but any you know basically iron rusts; it oxidizes, and so if you have F ferrous phosphate is iron in the plus two oxidation state. If you let it sit around, it's going to oxidize. It's going to be plus three. So he proved probably ferrous and ferric phosphate. In external applications, Schussler recommended it for sprains, wounds, hemorrhages, hemorrhoids. Basically, in Schussler's system, it was a replacement for arnica. And we'll talk about that more in a bit. He also proposed it as a substitute for ferrum phos. Excuse me, a ferrum phos is a substitute for aconite in the first stage of inflammations before exudation. So after the exudations, then he recommended calichloratum, which is uh, potassium chlorate, or commonly nowadays we use uh, Cali muriaticum. Um, we talked about this. The only two remedies that were proven of the 12 salts were silica and namir. But time has shown that even though uh, the oversimplification of only treating people with 12 remedies doesn't really work, uh, the, those 12 remedies have proven to be very clinically useful for, for patients. He gave them in lower potencies, but where they're homeopathic, higher uh, in the highest potencies have been given with good effects. Uh, Farrington uh, spoke of Farron Foss as a brief presentation, but a Dr. Houghton said that, well, we shouldn't reject a remedy on that account. And he, he, this is an interesting quote. He says, there is many a man now doing cephalic service who came by a breach presentation. The remedy had no choice as to the method of introduction to the medical <laughs> world. In other words, it's a useful remedy uh, just because it was brought in without approving and it's been proven subsequently, we can still use it. So it's useful for the first stage of inflammatory fevers and even in higher potencies and even in chronic and it's a deep acting antisoric. It's gonna be useful in chronic diseases like for example, chronic TB. There was a study uh, done in, uh, published in 2007-ish uh, that uh, they looked at the treatment of, of um, upper respiratory tract infections in the US and the UK. And one of the interesting things that came out of the study was that ferrum phos was much more used by human uh, practitioners 
uh, in the UK than in the US. It wasn't as well known in the US. Like I mentioned, over a thousand editions. And so now I'm going to go over the summary. I haven't called it a genius. It still needs some fleshing out. But let's go over the, what we're going to do is we're going to go over the summary. We'll go over a few symptoms from the uh, actual monograph, and then we'll go over a few cases. And there are a few cases that are interesting in terms from a, a veterinary perspective. So we'll maybe emphasize those a bit. And actually, the summary that I have here, a lot of it is written in uh, uh, Harvey Farrington's works. He really had a good feel for the um, the genius or the summary symptoms of ferrum phosphoricum. I really I found it was hard to improve on what he what he wrote in the early. So it's good useful in the early stages of febrile conditions. It stands min, midway between the sthenic or weakening. Uh, excuse me, the strong vital activity of aconitum and belladonna, and the asthenic that would be the weak, sluggish, and torpidity of gelsimium. The big thing is the typical Ferrum patient is not full-blooded or robust, kind of nervous, sensitive, anemic. And again, it's iron. The patient typically is anemic and they have a false plethora. And so it's similar to Ferrum Metallicum, this easy flushing with exertions, things like that. Um, false plethora means basically you look at the patient, they might have a fever. They're kind of pale. But it's like the cheeks are red, like you'd see with a clown almost, like you painted on red on the cheeks or pink on the cheeks. So you can see there's pinkness there, but it's not the pinkness of belladonna or aconite where the face, whole face, like belladonna, the whole face would be just beet red. And it'd just be, if you touched it with your finger, it'd be like, oh, hot, burning heat. Here, it's more of a localized uh, flushing of the cheeks and the underlying skin around it is, is more pale. Prostration is marked, sudden onset, so like aconite, like belladonna, pace is more active than gelsimium. But one of the key characteristics is it's similar to the difference between like aconite and arsenicum. Both can be have acute, but aconite tends to occur in a person who's very healthy and they get sick quickly and you get aconite well quickly. It has anxiousness, restlessness. Well, arsenicum has anxiousness, restlessness too with acutes, but it tends to be a much more sickly person. Well, that's the same thing with ferrum foss. It's similar to aconite, similar to belladonna, but in a more sickly person. And one of the big characteristics during fever is you can feel the pulse is compressible. With belladonna, with aconite, the pulse should be bounding. And that means you put your fingers on the pulse and you can't really compress it. But with ferrum foss, it's a weaker pulse. It's, it's kind of a bit strong uh, coming. You can feel it pretty, pretty fast. But if you press down, you can you can compress it more easily. Can't do that with aconite or belladonna. So the pulse is soft, compressible, flowing. There really isn't that much anxious restlessness of aconite, although they're better with ferrum foss, you're bet they're better with uh, cool. And so they might move to get like in the bed, a cool place, or maybe an animal would go to a cool place. That would be the restlessness, but not as restless as aconitum. Um, a lot of chest troubles, bronchitis, and also for acute exacerbations of tuberculosis. Um, uh, we have an event up here through our church called Veggie Fest, and uh, one year I had a woman come in during Veggie Fest. She was from Central or South America, and she had documented uh, tuberculosis, and she had a, um, it was a variant, uh, I'm not sure exactly the strain of tuberculosis, tuberculosis is one of the more rare strains, and she had a chronic cough, and she came in and said, hey, do you have anything for me? And that was it. And actually, I gave her Ferrum Foss, and um, she she did better. She came back the next day and the day after and said, I'm doing better. So that was a confirmation of it for its use in tuberculosis. Ferrum Foss, obviously, it has iron in a low potency. It can actually use, be used to increase hemoglobin. So in a person or an animal that's anemic, you can consider using um, Ferrum Foss um, in low potency to um, increase the hemoglobin. It's useful in hemorrhages. I have a patient. She's a very interesting patient. Um, she's um, she's been a patient now for um, God probably 15 years. She's a social worker. I started her with Causticum. Uh, she had very sensitive sensitivity to injustice, uh, psoriasis. That's basically gone away. Uh, she subsequently had a shock in her life and developed tachycardic cardiomyopathy, uh, which is kind of like a 
you know, people didn't die. It's almost like an acute heart attack syndrome, but it's just a, a acute cardiomyopathy. She responded well to aconite. Then, and she also obviously went to the hospital. They gave her meds, and as a result of that, she developed autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, she responded well to lycopodium and other remedies. Um, and uh, one of the symptoms she has is hemorrhages uh, from the nose, um, epistaxis. And uh, I've tried many remedies for her for the epistaxis, and Ferrumfos works every time. I think she's worked up to like a 50M, and she can take it, and within I mean, it, it hits her tongue and the bleeding stops. It's like that. No other remedy works as well. The hemorrhages tend to be bright, bright red. Uh, so fevers, pains, anemia, red face, like aconite and belladonna, but again, the compressible pulse in ferrum foss, and it's a false plethora. So it has two phases, the acute with the high fever, sudden onset, flushing, congestion, and the chronic recurrent or subacute. It's for the two extremes of life, children and old age. Okay. This view might be a little better. So they're, but instead of being vital like belladonna and aconite, typically are they're more anemic, lacking in physical vigor, very weak, malaise. And one of the characteristics in humans of, of ferrum foss, people needing ferrum foss, there's a sense of indolence and apathy. Uh, they have a high fever. There's a couple cases like this where they just want to lie down and relax. And they're aware, they're not delirious like, like uh, belladonna like a fever with delirium, they're not, they're not anxious and restless so much like aconite. It's more just like an indifference and apathy. But there can also be um, loquaciousness with the fever as well. So indifference to mental and physical labor, they want to lie down, exertion aggravates them, motion increases the pains. But like ferrum metallicum, ferrum foss is better with gentle motion, better with gentle motion. Very little restlessness, so very complacent. And I mentioned also sometimes they'll have a tendency to loquacity and mirth. There's one case of that with a kid with high fever, loquacious, mirthful, red face, high fever. They joke, laugh, chatter. Whenever they're affected, uh, can be with a not only with a fever but with a sprain. Uh, there'll be redness. Even with a little temperature, just flushing of the face or with mental excitement. Suffused redness, aggravated by exercise in a warm room. They're generally better with cool applications. And as I mentioned, they can be better with mild, uh, gentle motion. The fevers can get up to 106. Causative effects are it's usually like you're warm and getting chilled or a sudden chill or checking of perspiration on a warm day. Or it can be effect of trauma as a fall, heavy blow, overlifting. Uh, there is a rubric which I'm sure you're all familiar with. I've seen this clinically, people who have fever after injury. And the remedies to consider are aconite, I mean, arnica is there, and also ferrum foss. These are the main remedies to consider for if they're anxious and restless, maybe aconite. They're just more like more chill and 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 kind of uh, uh, you know more indolent and not so anxious and restless. You might consider ferrum foss and of course arnica. Um, could be from a fall, a heavy blow, overlifting, or infection. One of the other characteristics. They have dryness of the mucous membranes with thirst. So whenever I see a child uh, or someone with a fever, I always want to know about their thirst. If they're thirstless and high fever, sudden onset, the more sudden, the better, I would consider belladonna. If they're thirsty, I would have to differentiate between ferrum foss, which is thirsty, and aconite. But of course, the mental states are different with ferrum foss, more the indolence, and with uh, aconite, more the anxious restlessness, although not always. 
there's redness, there's throbbing. Again, makes you think of um, uh, belladonna. Pains are oppressive or pulsating, stitching, shooting. They can shoot downward or upward. This is especially with sciatica or muscular rheumatism. Pulsation is as strong as in belladonna. Stitching pains can be anywhere, but typically in the chest. In the swollen joints, the worst motion, heat, throbbing, shooting pains in the soft parts surrounding a fracture. This is where it can be used like arnica. So arnica is the most often remedy used for bruises and shocks. But if the injured part is swollen, hot, and throbbing, and there's not any bruise yet, you can try ferrum fos. Hemorrhages, passive arterial hemorrhage, it's bright red, free from nose, throat, gums, lungs, stomach, bladder, um, from an injury, a little less profuse flow than aconet or belladonna. Otitis media, one of the characteristics with otitis media, um, agonizing pains, and you'll get a bursting of the tympanic membrane and mucal perlant pus, but the characteristic here with ferrum fos is that when the when the uh, eardrum ruptures, the pain continues. And this is a, obviously a case that's moving on to in humans to mastoiditis. I don't know if there's a similar thing in animals, but uh, these are cases uh, you wonder and and uh, um, pretty serious cases. Um, And so we have epistaxis with coryza or sinusitis. It can occur in the morning after rising on blowing the nose, coughing, or sneezing. Or when nosebleed relieves a congestive headache. And the main remedy for that, um, we have head pain better after with epistaxis, better with epistaxis, is melilotus clover. But you see ferrum fossas there as well. Gastritis, vomiting of blood or food mixed with blood. Now the number one remedy for vomiting food, if we look here in uh, reference works, vomit food. The number one remedy, interestingly enough, is, let's see. There you go. It's, um, well, Chelidonium comes up, but if you look at the, uh, Chelidonium doesn't really have that many uh, citations, but if you look under Ferrum Metallicum, it goes on for pages about vomiting food, vomiting food, vomiting food. That's probably the number one remedy for vomiting food. And it's interesting that um, Ferrum Foss also has that, that symptom. Um, vomiting food or food mixed with blood, bleeding from the rectum, with pneumonia, bronchitis, tuberculosis, the sputum tends to be bloody or blood streaked. The menses tend to be bright red, copious, premature, bloody leucorrhea. The blood will can, even though it's bright red, can coagulate quickly, leave a gelatinous mass. And the bright, like we said, with the headaches, the bright red hemorrhage, like epistaxis, gives relief. The ferrum fos patient, you're looking for patients that's kind of weak, anemic, and they can have effects from loss of fluids like kina, like china, um, and other remedies. I believe it was Burnett that used it to cure nevi in children and varicose veins in young people it can be useful in the early stages of phlebitis, fever, fever, local heat, tenderness. The right side is principally effective, again, making us think of belladonna. Violent congestive headaches in the right side of the head, toothache on the right side, arthritis of the right shoulder. So again, this is probably the number one remedy in, in human medicine that we use for different types of shoulder tendonitis would be ferrum metallicum but we also have to think of ferrum phosphoricum. Inflammation of the right ovary. The aggravations, not a lot of time aggravations, but the rheumatic pains, fever, cough, or worse at night, and epistaxis and perspiration, worse in the morning, four to six a.m. 
It can have bad effects of sun heat like belladonna, glonoine. The ferrum phos patient, again, they're kind of a weak patient, an anemic patient. They feel cold quite a bit on the head and the back. And they can get headache, neuralgia, back, back, neck, shoulder pains by sitting in a cold air or draft. The cough is worse from cold things and in the open air, much like phosphorus. So this is more of a phos phosphorus element in ferrum phos. Warm and covering make the patient more, more uh, comfortable. And this is a big characteristic. The pains are usually better from cold applications, which there aren't so many remedies having that. Pulsatilla, maybe sulfur, letum. So the, one of the strong characteristics, the headache is better with cold applications. Toothache is better by holding cold water in the mouth, like the remedy coffea. Rheumatoid pains, neuralgia, better with cold compresses. However, deeper inflammations can be relieved by heat. So better by heat doesn't rule out ferrum phos. The rheumatism is also characterized by the fact that it's wandering one joint after another. And they're puffy, red, high fever, so acute rheumatic fever type picture. Um, this would be similar, this wandering pain like to pulsatilla, and unlike rust tox, which doesn't typically have wandering pains. Desire to lie down is not just entirely weakness, the worst standing. And Worse standing is present for other symptoms. One of the main, uh, one of the big uh, in the cases that you'll see is there's a thing, diurnal enuresis, which means people have a bladder incontinence while they're standing, not at night when they're sleeping, but while they're standing. So diurnal enuresis in children and actually adults is frequently confirmed in, uh, in, um, in, in Ferrum Foss. We talked about uh, movement. Worse exertion, much like ferrum metallicum, active motion increases, but slower gentle motion relieves. So similar to ferrum metallicum and pulsatilla. Aconite and belladonna can be distinguished by the thirst. Well, aconite is thirsty like ferrum phos, belladonna is not with fever, but also by the mental symptoms. Aconite is anxious, restless, fear of death. Actually, Aconite is more characteristic for it, has a presentiment of death. It thinks it has a high fever and they think they're going to die. They say, I'm going to die tonight. Um, that's useful clinically when patients say that, you know, it's a serious ailment. Belladonna has more hallucinations, delirium, even mania. And ferrum phos is more passive, uh, more indolent, could be loquacious. And belladonna is more sensitive to touch and jar. That's one of the confir good confirmatories of belladonna. If you jar the person when they're lying in bed, if they, if they get aggravated a lot by that, you consider that's a confirmatory for belladonna. But of the three, only ferrum phos is ameliorated by cold ap applications and by gentle motion. So those are two good uh, confirmatories to, to find uh, ferrum phos, that it's better with cold applications, better with gentle motion. And of course, Instead of the full bounding pulse of aconite and belladonna, you have the compressible pulse. Anemic subjects who have sour, sour or greasy erectations, they're dyspeptic. And again, the vomiting food. In dysentery, first stage with a lot of blood, so bloody stools. Stools are green, watery, mucus, blood, pure blood or bloody mucus. Retching, the child rows its head and moans, eyes half open, face pinched, urine scantry, like a, like a dysenteric picture, almost a choleric picture. Pulse and respiration are accelerated, starting in the sleep, aggravation midnight till morning. Uh, it's a main remedy for summer complaint. That's like diarrhea during the summer. Um, thirst, sweat, we talked about this. Discharges are blood streaked. It's a useful remedy after operations on the throat, like after tonsillectomy or other throat operation, or on the nose. It controls the bleeding and relieves the soreness. It has, again, a marked thirst, especially during fever or during the latter part of the day for large quantities of cold water at frequent intervals. And food, um, it has a version of milk, nausea and vomiting after eating, and a, 
The vomiting is characterized by vomiting of food. Uh, vomiting matter so sour it sets the teeth on edge. And it's worse from meat, herring, coffee, cake, especially sour things. And it's the vomiting is three to four hours after each meal. Sometimes that can be significant. We're all familiar with the arsenicum vomiting, which is you, you, you in gastroenteritis, you, you swallow something, you eat something, and you vomit immediately after eating or drinking. Uh, and then we're familiar with the phosphorus um, uh, gastroenteritis, where you want cold drinks or ice cold drinks. And 15 or 20 late, minutes later, when, you, when the drinks get warm in the stomach, then you vomit. Well, this is three to four hours later. And of course, the vomiting of food. It can be used in cancerous uh, affections to relieve pain. And there are uh, one or two cases of that. I'm going to go through a few of the symptoms here from the monograph. So this is how the monographs are set up. There's an introduction to the remedy. There's a summary or a genius of the remedy. And then the actual characteristic symptoms. Um, mental, we talked about the indifference to ordinary matters. And there's a craving for brandy, brandy uh, feeling of indolence, especially with fever, talkative and hilarious, unnatural excitement, especially with fever. This is a pertinent symptom for veterinary medicine. And there's a case like this, um, sows, which is, I believe, um, uh, pig mothers, uh, they will eat up their young. It's called uh, uh, mania transitoria or transient mania. Um, and they say in the books, it says it's upon hyperemia of the brain. I wonder, um, you know, maybe the moms are anemic. Maybe they're, they're in certain situations or they're, um, they're maybe made to produce a lot of kids and, and uh, uh, little piglets. And so they're, they become anemic. And maybe that's why this, this, this happens it's because of anemia. I don't know. If anyone wants to comment on that, I'd be interested in what you have to say. Um, Cheerful during the heat, the mirth, hilarity, liveliness during the fever, laughing, loquacious, foolish, indolence, aversion to work, uh, complaints of hysterical adolescent girls with associated with premenstrual depression, talkative, excited but not anxious, weakness both mentally and physically, commonly associated with marked circulatory instability. Then we have vertigo, um, violent headache, throbbing, followed and better by nosebleed. Again, that ubiquitous nosebleed and bleeding. Violent headaches during menstruation. The head is extremely sensitive to pain. Ears, the eardrums are red and bulging. Acute otitis, when belladonna fails. We have a case where the child uh, was given belladonna and higher potency belladonna, no change, and then ferrum floss finally cured the kid. Ear is sensitive to touch. And then once there's a discharge, once there's been a rupture of the tympanic, of the tympanic membrane, um, the pain remains. That's always not a good sign. That's uh, a sign that uh, mastoiditis is developing. So sometimes uh, ferrum could re could uh, prevent that from happening. And the discharge, of course, can be bloody. And it does have mastoiditis. Nose, nosebleeds when the blood is bright red with tend tendency to coagulate rapidly. Face, florid complexion, that, that red complexion, but with a kind of a pale background. And red face from cough, from excitement after exertion during fever. Lips are chapped and dry, a deep fissure in the middle of the lower lip. It's interesting, this is the uh, uh, keynote symptom of nitro muriatico, another uh, cell salt. Uh, well, no, I'm not sure Neutromere is a cell salt, but um, that is a common uh, symptom in Neutromere, a confirmatory symptom, but Ferrum Foss has it as well. Um, the child during dentition is restless, irritable, has fever, flushed face, sparkling eyes, and dilated pupils. It looks just like belladonna, but if you give belladonna, it's not working, the fever's still up. I don't wait anymore. I just tell the parents then switch to... Uh, switch to ferrum foss, and often they'll do the trick. They'll see if they're thirsty, they have somewhat of the false plethora, the compressible pulse. The thirst is marked for cold water at frequent intervals. So it's a thirsty remedy. Peritonitis, it's a good remedy for peritonitis, arising from cold. 
hemorrhage of the bowels, hemorrhage anywhere, bright red, coagulate quickly, stools are watery, contain mucus and blood. Useful in uh, diurnal enuresis, so loss of urine, incontinence of urine during the day, especially on standing. Better line. So mostly during the day, not at night. And again, as I mentioned, uh, if you want this full monograph, it's in uh, reference works now. Cough with ejection of urine during pregnancy. So the incontinence of urine that happens during cough during pregnancy. Pneumonia, expectoration of clear blood. Cold drinks aggravate the cough like phosphorus. And the ammonia on the lower right side. Or it could be left sided. So it is more right sided, but could have some left sided symptoms. And here in tuberculosis, a woman 49, pneumonia of the left upper lobe, crepitation, profuse expectoration of frothy, pink mucus, patient almost moribund. Hemoptysis after concussion or fall. Again, it's similar to arnica, ailments after injury. High fever, so traumatic fever. Again, time of aggravation, 4 to 6 a.m. Aconitum tends to be earlier. Like you get an exposure to a chill or something in that later that evening up to midnight. Well, Pharmphos tends to be a little slower, 4 to 6 a.m. And in rather than phosphorus, this sputum is bright red rather than the rusty sputum. Chill, uh, 1 p.m while sitting or 2 p.m. They can have fever with very little thirst. More characteristic is the thirst though. That's what I usually look for and what I can confirm. But it could be the other way. There's usually this, they wanna lie down. They're not very vital with the fever. Um, again, it's a, kind of a fever in a person with a weak constitution, maybe a bit anemic, so they wanna lie down when they get sick. The bleeding is bright red from anywhere, coagulating easy, anemia, and pale, bleeding in pale anemic subjects. All the pains are worse motion, excitement, warmth, better by cold, better by slow motion. And like we talked about, worse at night, four to 6 a.m., worse with touch, worse with jar, not as much as with belladonna. Belladonna is more sensitive to jar, worse with motion, on the right side, but better by slow or gentle motion. Better with cold applications, but the deeper inflammations can be better with heat. These are related remedies. Um, it stands midway between aconite and gelsimium. Aconite is more of a bounding pulse, not so compressible and more restless and anxious. Gelsemium has is more soft flowing pulse, more drowsiness and dullness. With Ferrofoss, it's not dullness, it's more just an indolence and a desire to lie down, but they're alert, they know what's going on around them. Gelsemium is kind of out of it. With anemic conditions, we can compare uh, China, Kina. And according to Schussler and other authors after Ferrum-Foss, once the exudation occurs, you can consider calimuriaticum, especially if the exudation is white. Um, it's interesting, I'm presently working on the monograph of calimuriaticum, and it's the same situation. It's a remedy, another remedy by breech birth. And so it was introduced into homeopathic practice by Schussler without provings, and it's the same situation. It's like there's a lot of clinical indications, but not a lot of, it's hard to find good, uh, characteristic symptoms on which to prescribe it. Um, any uh, questions before we start the cases? Jeff?
Uh, sorry, I had myself muted. Um, I don't see any from the attendees. I can't tell. Um, there's a bunch of panelists here. So Sue, Richard, uh, Henrietta, Judy, and then you guys have questions for Tim. Nope, I guess nothing. Actually, I don't have the chat. Tim, the only, it's Susan Beale. The only comment back to your pig, the piggies eating up her babies and, and that sort yeah. of stuff. It's it's really common to see anemia, particularly in confinement animals, um, in in pigs, um, and it's been you know that that's 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 really common. So it's mostly in factory farmed animals. No, no. It, it, when that reference would have been written, it would have been too. You know, they 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 tend to be anemic anyway, but they really see a lot of anemia when we get them off the dirt and and onto concrete. It it's a huge problem. And then you see more of them eating eating their eating their young. Oh, they eat their babies in confinement for a bunch of reasons, but but it's, it's an it's interesting. That's an interesting remedy. I I I'm gonna go back. I don't know whose original citation that was to track it to track it down beyond that, but I'm gonna go back and see if I can try and find it. Uh, let's look and see. Uh, say again. So eight. That's herring. Okay. Thank you. See if we can find. Ah, it comes from uh, actually from Schusler. Okay. Several farmers have, upon my advice, given this with constant success, fair and fast to sows who have become possessed with the mania of eating their young. Mania transitoria is dependent upon hyperemia of the brain. Well, who knows? But it, I think it could be uh, anemia. <laughs> well, and and you know, I don't know about 1874, but I do know that there are some situations we see salt poisoning in hogs as well when they're when they're fed relatively. Um, you know, the same the same thing that we see in humans with with uh, salt water balance and that sort of stuff. Ah, so they get like uh, encephalopathy. Yeah, yeah. Ah, so that might be that might have something to do with it. Yeah, in humans, if the sodium's too low, you'll tend to get delirium, or if it's too high, you can get delirium. Right. Good. Well, thank you. Yeah. So if this is a clinical entity that still occurs. Definitely so. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a reference that's originally from Schusler, and you'd have to, if you look in Schusler's book, you'll see uh, um, maybe he put the author in there. But he, you know, at, at the time when Schusler published his book in 1874, he collected all the data on these, on the kind of the eclectic and, and just the use of these substances uh, um, up until that time. All right, let's, uh, let's go through a few of these cases. Um, this one, again, diurnal aneurysis. This is in a woman, 30, four weeks after giving delivery, uh, discharge of bright red, oozing blood with worse lightest exertion, ceasing when at rest, Ferrumfos 1x three times a day, and it cured both the metrorrhagia and the aneurysis. Although, uh, four weeks after partruition, after delivery, that still could be Lokia. I don't know if we'd call it metrorrhagia or Lokia. Um, and again, this is another case, incontinence of urine only during the day, Ferrum Foss, and quite well. Here's a cancer case, serous of the left breast, lancinating pains, enlargement of the laxillary glands, so already uh, spread to the glands, excruciating pains, dusky yellow complexion, so you have the anemia, pinch features, tried many different remedies, hydrasis, conium, acetic acid, gave Ferrum Foss finally. Pimples broke out over the body, and that's always a good sign. Uh, and uh, vertigo and a feeling of general prostration. Uh, spots disappeared, and from feeling exhausted, she became stronger. The appetite improved and more wonderful still. The excruciating, lancinating pains became subsided. Um, so this is from Cooper. Cooper was a homeopath, I believe an English homeopath. He treated a lot of cancer cases. He's one of the ones who kind of, along with Burnett, he was a contemporary of Burnett. Um, they really tried to focus on treating difficult cases like cancer cases and had some good success. Here we go. Um, and you see the cases are in, uh, alpha, uh, in um, chronological order. This was, case was uh, from 1868. The first case that I could find was from uh, 1868. 
so a little before um, uh, Schussler published in 1874. So these remedies were already in use. Um, okay, boy 16, rheumatism, aggravated by the slightest motion, wandering, hand, shoulder, hip were principally affected, Ferenfoss, four every three hours, every symptom disappeared. And then here's, of course, the sows. Um, frontal headache followed and relieved by nosebleed. And there's another peculiar symptom, which is characteristic of, of Farron Foss, that on stooping, they can't see as if all the blood ran into her eyes, cured by Farron Foss. This is another, actually another case. This is one case. This is another case. The pearl fever. And here with the fever, there's a hilarious delirium, a lot of talking, mirthfulness, loquacity. Farenfall six in water every hour at 7 p.m. The symptoms subsided. Good. The patient was cheerful and comfortable. This is an acute articular rheumatism of the right shoulder, swollen, red, very tender. Farenfall cured. There's an articular rheumatism worse from slightest motion. Although it can also be better with slight motion, but not that would be more in a chronic with acute. You would see, tend to see it more worse with motion. Here, the patient, weak, pale, cachectic, earache on the right side for four or five days. For three days, the ear has been discharging without relief of the pain. That's the key here. Even though the tympanic membrane is ruptured and there's discharge, I'd say nine times or nine, 95, nine times out of 10 or 95 times out of 100 when the eardrum ruptures. Uh, the pain is relieved, but here you have a case where it's not relieved. That's not a good sign. It's mastoid sort of touch, so it's going to mastoiditis. Ferenfoss 2X was prescribed. The patient was better in every way the next day. Continued for one week, in which all the inflammatory symptoms are fast started. Special features were the anemic state, the radiating character of the pain, and its persistence after the discharge. Okay. A uh, physician in a neighboring city called a child been very ill with low bar pneumonia, a sudden rise of three degrees in temperature with dyspnea, suggested ferrum foss, given every two hours, improvement was rapid and complete. So a good remedy for pneumonia. And here's a butcher, got overheated, running after some cattle, um, was taken with the rheumatism of the right foot and, and left hand. Ferrum foss 6X every two hours cured him. This is a young man hunting, he took cold, affected the throat, larynx, pharynx, inflamed, ulcers on the tonsil, high fever, very thirsty, so high fever, thirst, restless. It's the restlessness not so typical. Uh, Ferenfoss 6, every two hours cured. Uh, Mrs. W, two weeks pregnant, had been vomiting nearly everything that she had eaten for these two weeks. Only food was vomited. And that's soon after eating. So vomiting of food, Ferenfoss 12X. Vomiting was very much controlled and in a month had ceased entirely. Hemoptysis. So she'd had a sister, this is Mrs. S, uh, 27. Excuse me. Uh, her sister had died two years ago from consumption. Three years ago, the patient suddenly attacked at the menstrual period by, during the menstruation, a profuse, bright red and frothy hemorrhage from the lungs. A mere streak to a mouthful of pure blood, thirsty, drinking a lot of water. Ferrum Foss 1X. Next morning, much better. Now we're up to 1889. This is an interesting uh, case. Um, this is from 1890. Um, of influenza prevention. Now, the big uh, influenza pandemic was not till 1918, 1919. Um, that was that pandemic where um, you know, a lot of people died, millions of people died worldwide. That's the Spanish flu. Um, and um, the homeopaths found that certain remedies were very helpful during that pandemic, um, chalcimium, which was then often used as a genus epidemicus to prevent. But this author found that ferrum Foss was useful. So shortly before the influenza made its appearance in 1890 here in the West, I sent two members of my uh, of my family who live in other places and gave to other members Ferrum Foss 12 
to take a few pellets twice daily. It has proved itself in every case protective, protective of fluids, preventative, and has cured every patient treated by it in from one to three days. Now, whether this would work every year, I doubt it. It must have been that year was more of a Ferrum-Foss type flu. Pneumonia never developed under these remedies, which is important because oftentimes with flu, I don't know how it is in animals, but with humans, it's the pneumonia that occurs after the flu that is often, if it's going to be fatal, it's pneumonia that often get people. And oftentimes there'll be associated bacterial pneumonia. So here, pneumonia didn't develop. And if existing before they could be given, the inflammation would be cured. Okay. And then maybe other remedies needed if they progressed. Uh, in an influenza case of three weeks duration with coughing and vomiting of food, in half an hour's time after taking the second dose, the cough and all the trouble stopped at once without returning a single time. And then he comments, the large list of dead persons could have been avoided or at least very reduced mm -hmm. to a very small minimum had prejudice and hatred towards homeopathy not prevented allopathic physicians from employing these specific remedies, which could be found out only by experiments on the healthy. Some physicians believe in gelsimium to possess that specific. The similarity with ferrum Foss is indeed very great, but all the symptoms combined showed closer to ferrum Foss and the main characteristic symptom of influenza, the profound weakness and prostration is much more peculiar to ferrum Foss. I mean, you could argue with this reasoning. It just seems like this year, uh, for some reason, the flu was was very well uh, prevented and it seems like even symptoms of it were treated very well with Ferrum Foss. Whether that would be true in a, a future uh, epidemic is 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 open for question, uh, but it's interesting to know that it could be a useful remedy and could maybe be the genus epidemicus of a flu epidemic. My first experience in Faribault conditions, stout child, 18 months, Mother and beginning aconite and bell belladonna for 12 hours, no relief. The skin was hot and burning, like belladonna. The cheeks were highly flushed, like belladonna. The eyes sparkling, like belladonna. The pupils dilated, like belladonna. And the child in a state of extreme restlessness and irritability. Uh, by default, they gave ferrum Foss six x in water every hour. The first dose quieted, and the child got better. And the next day was well. Another case of diurnal aneurysis. Now here's a case of more serious pneumonia. Uh, this is a case from Ferris uh, in the homeopathic recorder from 1892. The worst case of pneumonia that I pneumonia that I ever saw ever saw recover. In this case, we had complete hepatization of the left lung. It was completely uh, solidified and of the lower lobe of the right lung. So a pretty serious pneumonia with a strong tendency to hepatization of both lungs. A most rapid pulse, small and weak. So the weakness of the pulse, the temperature of 103 to 104. 28 years old and of robust constitution. So this kind of goes against uh, ferrum Foss a little bit. You'd think of it in a weaker person, but maybe with a really serious illness like this. The amount of mucopurulent sputum expectorated was simply enormous. He made a good recovery and seems to be in excellent health with Ferrum Foss. And we mentioned the varicocele. Uh, Burnett reports a cure of a varicocele and varicosphange with a continued use of Ferrum Foss 6. And he says here, ferrum Foss is most useful in the varicosities of the old, fluoric acid in the young. Again, another case of a, a boy, seven, delicate. So that's what you kind of person you think of. Um, maybe a kind of person that you would maybe need silica in, wets his pants every day. So diurnal aneurysis, you think of ferrum Foss. About 12 years ago, now we're up to 1897. About 12 years ago, I began treating a girl four for frequent epistaxis, later for hemorrhage of the tongue and gums, an alarming nosebleed, which could only be controlled by plugging the posterior nares. After treating her for about a year for frequent alarming hemorrhages, I gave her ferrum Foss. So it took them uh, a year to come to ferrum Foss, three grains, three times a day. No attacks occurred while taking the remedy. And in fact, now in the repertory, if we look under epistaxis in children, ferrum is there, but ferrum foss 
is a two, probably should be elevated to a three as well. And let's look under old people too. Uh, it's there, Farron Foss there, and I, I can confirm that for my patient. She's in her late 60s, early 70s now, and Farron Foss is a fantastic remedy for her nosebleeds. Um, very good. Ah, we're in 1904. Cincinnati Medical Advance. A child four years old, I'm going to sleep, invariably wet the bed. This was the case, even if he slept only a few minutes. Farron Foss cured the case in about two weeks. So here, um, it's a nocturnal aneurysis. So it could be useful for that as well. And this is a uh, case from, I believe, with a lot of interesting discussion, which we'll go over some of it, from Farrington, Harvey Farrington, who knew this remedy very well. And like I mentioned, his, his summary of Ferrum Foss, I, I used most of it because it was really hard to improve. He really reviewed the literature at the time and really kind of nailed it uh, in terms of the summary symptoms. So this is a report by Harvey Farrington, uh, who, of course, was from Chicago. So he was familiar with Lake Michigan and going there for vacation. Several years ago, while camping on the shores of Lake Michigan, a little girl of the party came down with a peculiar fever. I had no thermometer, but judged that the temperature reached about 102. The skin everywhere rapidly became red, so that at first one might take it for a case of scarlatina. There was little or no weakness. The pulse was full and rapid, yet easily compressible. That's the key, the compressible pulse. And though rather talkative, she was content to lie quiet. So you have the talkativeness, the compressible pulse, high fever, wants to lie quietly in a hammock and be waited on. Here was a red skin, mild cerebral condition, congestion, without restlessness or anxiety, and sudden unfit of Ferrum Foss. And the cause, again, fit with Ferrum Foss, bathing in the hot sun and getting chilled by cool like wind, so heated and then chilled. A 200 Ferrum Foss subdued the whole condition a few hours. Next day, another of the children manifested the same symptoms, was relieved with equal promptness. So there's a little discussion. Uh, another gentleman, Dr. Patch, says, I waited a good many years to see a case of typical Ferrum Foss pneumonia, but it came at last, and the characteristic of the case was a sputum which is very much like blood washings. It was a diluted bloody water and quite profuse. And another Dr. Chimes had said, oh, I remember a similar case in a young man, temperature of 104. Next morning, his temperature was normal after a single dose of Ferrum Foss, bloody sputum. And then Dr. Bozier, we all know Dr. Bozier's synoptic, synoptic uh, um, Materia Medica, I have not heard any reference to the great power of Ferrum Foss in acute exacerbation of tuberculosis. There is hardly any remedy to take its place. It is a pure palliative, but the power of Ferrum Foss is wonderful in these cases. And then Dr. McLaren pipes in. Um, he says, well, in college, we used to eat the triturates when we got hungry. Uh, I guess they didn't have candy at the time. And we were never influenced by any of the things we consumed until one day my roommate filled his pocket pockets with tablets of Ferrum Foss and returning in the afternoon, put his hand in his pockets and ate several tablets. That night he was taken very sick, face extremely flushed, violent palpitations of the heart, which lasted about an hour and a half, very flushed face and frightful headache. So, um, and he was very silly, frightened, talked about himself some, was not delirious at all. So, so he was proving the Ferrum Foss. Reminds me of when they had the uh, demonstrations against homeopathy and uh, uh, the 1023 demonstrations that, you know, it's beyond Avogadro's number and all this and that. And people were, were proving, uh, were taking, just taking remedies that they bought and just eating the whole bottle. Uh, it'd be interesting if a few of them had some provings. That's uh, certainly possible. Dr. Hayes said, I attended a little girl last winter, temperature was 105, inclination to talk all the time, and to move about to find a cool place in the bed. So here, the, it wasn't really restlessness, it was more that she liked the cool. Physical restlessness, no fear of anxiety, she was well in 24 hours with Farron Foss. And then Farrington comes in and says, I had hoped some of our older men would bring out more on the chronic side. I'm glad that Dr. Bozier spoke of this of that special one, the, chronic tuberculosis. The remedy has been used in phthisis or quick consumption that has produced benefit. 
And again, that's something I can confirm from the one patient I saw who had uh, tuberculosis, and it definitely helped uh, her cough. If there is restlessness, it may be, as one speaker has just hinted, the patient is trying to find a cool place in the bed. So Farrington, I mean, uh, his writings on this remedy are are like gold. It's it's just uh, he really gets the remedy, really got it. Um, here's a case. Now we're up to 1928. Chronic hemorrhagic anemia. Um, Hemoglobin was low, red cells were low, restored to normal a little over nine months. The treatment was five drops of 30 uh, ferrum phosphate morning and evening, diet rich in iron and phosphorus. And here's an interesting case. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Rice um, from 19, uh, it's an interesting case from 1931. He practiced apparently in uh, Hawaii. Um, shortly after I began practice in the Hawaiian Islands, I was called one morning to see the daughter of one of the local sugar magnets, a child 12 years old. Um, bed, the sick child was pretty sick. A room in total darkness, as the curtains were drawn aside, the child drew the covers over her head. So photophobia, severely injected conjunctiva, dilated pupils, some lacrimation, the face and body were red hot and covered with perspiration. The temperature was just over 104. The pulse was high, full and bounding. Throbbing headache, dry mouth, thirst, coated tongue, sore throat. Belladonna, fair skin, blue eyes, etc. So what did he do? Belladonna, 30, very confident. I returned in the evening. Imagine my surprise to find my patient, if anything, a little worse than she was in the morning. Belladonna had not made the slightest impression. No other remedy could be indicated, so he went to the 200. Uh, I tried to kind of reassure the mother, there's no cause for uneasiness. Following morning, same state, still high fever. Imagine my chagrin. There was now nothing else to do but give placebo and go back to my office and study to find the reason why Belladonna had failed to cure. My first problem, I found no answer after careful search. Ferrum Foss had similar symptoms that it was the next best remedy. I returned at once and gave Ferrum Foss 30. Imagine my surprise when I called in the evening to find that the remedy had done just what I had expected of Belladonna when I first prescribed it. Under the influence of Ferrum Foss, my patient made a speedy recovery. The appropriate remedy was chosen on practically one symptom, the pulse, all their symptoms because it had to be set aside. Now, it's interesting, in this case, the pulse was high, full, and bounding. It doesn't talk about a compressible pulse, uh, but in a case like this, if someone has a high fever, especially with the use of uh, uh, antipyretics and stuff, like Tylenol, et cetera, nowadays, I would always, a patient like this, I would say, you know, if it's, I think it's a belladonna picture, try belladonna, but maybe have a remedy like Ferrum in hand. If after three or four hours you're not seeing a change, just go ahead and try Ferrum Here, the pulse didn't really fit, uh, but um, because it was full pulse was high, full and bounding, it wasn't compressible, but, you know, it worked. However, there uh, while there is equal degree of arterial and cardiac expectation, the pulse of ferrum phosphate is always compressible, not with belladonna. Sudden onset of symptoms, it's severe throbbing pain, flushed face, rapid rise, belladonna. And then Heprosol, but he says, in my opinion, Ferrum Foss will do the work of both and do it better. And then Pulford uh, comments. The characteristic mark of stamp, which will never fail in Belladonna, is a burning heat and redness, to which dryness may be added, and large pupils, which are sensitive to light, a flushed skin, which is generally scarlet red, especially during the fever, and a throbbing with, and this is what I usually look for, cold hands and feet. Hot head, cold hands and feet, you think of belladonna. High fever, red, thirst, and thirstless, you think of belladonna. On the other hand, after ferrum phosphate has produced occasionally from only certain conditions, it's flushed face and it's enlarged pupils. Belladonna pulse is incompressible, ferrum phosphate, it's compressible because they're anemic. And then Bozier says, for many years, it has been my custom to think of ferrum phosphate first at the beginning of an otitis and at the beginning of a mastoiditis. I am satisfied that ferrum phosphate covers more cases of mastoiditis than capsicum ever did. 
and capsicum, capsicum is a three, I believe, in, in uh, mastoiditis. Baron Foss should be a three. Inflammation. Uh, carries mastoid, that's what I want. Well, uh, here in the Materia Medica re uh, repertory, uh, Materia Medica per project repertory, uh, Ferrum Foss is a four and Capsicum is also a four. It is only occasional that Capsicum helps you out in these cases and in the pneumonia. Of course, you know that most cases of mastoiditis comes on in a sluggish way. And that fits Ferrum Foss. bronchitis after operation for inguinal hernia. So after operation, you think bronchitis pneumonia, you think of um, you think of Ferrum Foss. Now we're getting to more modern times, 1940s, World War II time. And here now we're up to 2006. You see there was a large period of time where the maybe the 30s, 20s, and before there were quite a few prescriptions, then it was harder to find cases. Um, so now we're in the 2000s, the 2007. Uh, Sandy, 35, presented with exhaustion, suffered from heavy periods, but during the last seven years they have become heavier. Hemoglobin was 10.6. Iron deficiency anemia was prescribed iron. Iron made her constipated. She says, I bruise easily. Sensitive to noise. She felt an immediate improvement in her energy on Ferrumfoss 12C once a day, and after a month of treatment, her hemoglobin was marginally improved. After three months, the hemoglobin was 11.8. After six months, 12.4. Her heavy periods decreased, and after a year, she stopped taking the remedies regularly and needed only a short course after a heavy bleed or when she felt tired. And that's it. Here's the references. Here's the different, uh, all the different sources that we used. The main ones we usually start with are um, Allen's Encyclopedia, Herring's Guiding Symptoms, and then uh, these are all journals. And also this is Schusler, uh, the Schusler book. Uh, Dewey, and then also Borky and Dewey, 12 uh, tissue remedies of Schusler. And then Farrington, of course. Farrington was a, a great addition to the monograph. OK. So um, basically, that's uh, my presentation. Um, I'd be happy to answer any uh, questions anyone anyone has. So here we have in Ferrum Foss a very good remedy for acute, very similar to aconite, belladonna. It has a thirst of aconite, but it's more not the anxious restlessness. It has more of the indolence, maybe the hilarity, the loquacity. It's thirsty, um, and it has a compressible pulse, but also useful for chronic conditions, maybe pneumonia. Um, the, the sow problem of eating their young after birth, another issue. Um, I'd be interested also to hear if anyone has any experience uh, using uh, Ferrum Foss in, uh, in veterinary medicine and, and for what and what, you know, what the results were. So, Jeff, I'll hand uh, things back over to you and answer yep, any questions yep. if anyone has any questions. Yep, great. Um, uh, Dr. Pitcairn has a couple of comments. One uh, refers to the Kent Repertory Rubric, uh, female pain bearing down a uterus, which has ferrum and ferrum, uh, I ferrum, the iodum, but no ferrum fuss. So I don't know about that Kent Rubric. Um, and also the subrubric of worse on urging to urinate. So here's the here's the rubric: uh, female pain bearing down uterus. Um, in this repertory, this is an addition. Ferrum Foss is an addition from eight, which is herring. But there's ferrum, ferrum iodum, um, and ferrum Foss. I think ferrum iodum has a peculiar symptom. It's like something's being pressed up when you sit down. It's like something's being pushed up, almost like a uterus is getting pushed up. Um, so that's that's the, the, com that the, com that the complete, or was that a, that was that addition was already there that you got material medic project and add that one right? 
Yes, this is an addition right here from the Ferrum Foss. Uh, is an addition. This is the Materia Medica per project. Uh, it's from the complete based on the complete repertory 4.5, but with the Materia Medica per project additions, uh, recent as of April of 2018. And let's see the one with urination. So uterus uh, bearing down. Oh, let's do this bearing down uterus <clears throat> in region of worse during urination. Ferrum Foss is there. Yeah, so Ferrum Foss. I don't and see any that, of the other Ferrums there. That one was an addition by the uh, by the, by you guys, right? Yeah, this is by uh, MMPP addition. This is yep. an addition actually I made. Uh, that's more characteristic for sepia, but also palladium and and nux vomica are and it looks like in Kent's repertory. And the mycoplodium has been added by um, Tyler. And uh, MMPP is is uh, the ferrum foss. Okay. Perfect. I don't know. It's interesting. I notice in this version of the repertory under MMPP, which is at 908, it has here fairies. Uh, I have no idea. I think that that's a mistake. It's no. This is an MMPP edition that I made that I made as part of the MMPP. I don't know why the the name is fairies. I I don't even know who that author is. I don't know what that, but it should be. This is an MMPP edition. It should be, uh, it should say Sane, Andre Sane. Okay. So I do not see any other questions or comments. Suited, do you have anything you wanted to add about the pigs, uh, not neutrum muriaticum, or anything of that sort? No, I, I don't have anything specifically about the pigs, but I, I'm just thinking about the folks that I'm going to talk to here in the next little while, and, and uh, particularly in some really big confinement hog barns. Um, so it, it, it could be kind of, kind of interesting. And, and just generally, this remedy, I, I suspect I have been under prescribing it. Hmm. It's a bit, it's one of those remedies because of the breach delivery part, it's hard to get characteristic symptoms to prescribe it. But you see, there are quite a few characteristic symptoms and a lot more clinical indications. Um, it would be interesting to do a study if, if like in a, in a, a confined uh, hog farm, if uh, in the nursery or wherever they would take the, 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 the sows when they're giving birth, and if there, there was a lot of this uh, eating of the young going on, be interesting to put uh, do a study where you put the uh, ferrum foss in a low potency six or thirty in their water, and, yeah, and, and you know, have a have a control group and an experimental group see if there's a difference and publish that. Yeah. That would be uh, that would be great. That would be an interesting study. Yeah, your head's going exactly where mine went as soon as I <laughs> as soon as I heard that. And it's really easy to medicate medicate those confinement barns because they've all got dosimeters in their water. So yeah, there you go. Okay, if you ever great. do that, let me know, and I'll, uh, you know, oh, we'll include that as part of the monograph. Oh yeah. For posterity, people will will know. The idea is to have this, all this data available in the programs online, um, so that you know, basically, what we're creating with the MMPP is basically a new version of Herring's guiding symptoms, but with all the literature since since uh, you know the late. 1800s because that was basically when herring published he looked at all the literature before that this includes what's in herring plus all the cases since and usually a new genius as well and then adding it all to the repertory so uh yeah that would be uh that would be an interesting study to do Help and then we can include it in the monograph so then all the homeopathic community would uh, veterinary human um well, for, forget the forget the homeopathic community. Well, you know, I'm thinking about uh, the conventional farmers. confinement dudes. Yep. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I'm sure. What do they do for those situations? They probably just sit that a a, a loss and move on, right? There's probably yeah, and they, they call the yeah. sows and you know, yeah, blah blah. <clears throat> yeah. Or sedate them. Actually, actually, what they usually do is they medicate them and and sedate them. Um, and sometimes they fool with some of their, uh, some of the times they fool with some of their other nutritional input. Yeah, but I mean, it seems like giving a remedy and putting it in their water, it'd be very cost effective and very, uh, it would save them money. Yeah, yeah. I'm heading, I'm actually the, heading. The big pharma people would probably not be very happy. Oh, no, they'll be very unhappy. But I'm actually heading to the Midwest here in a couple of days and, and I'm going to make sure and, and, uh, um, 
I can think of three or four different hog operations just without thinking hard about uh, about that to to actually get get moving on this. Cool. Yeah, that would be Thank great you. if you if you do that, uh, Susan. Uh, for sure, let me know. Keep me apprised of what's going on, and then if we can get some numbers or something, it'd be great. We can include it in the monograph, and I'd say even boy, that be you know if you got good something that's statistically significant, uh, you know that'd be something you could publish. I don't know if I don't know what it's like in the uh, in the veterinary journals now in the U.S. It's very hard to publish uh, homeopathic articles in conventional medical literature. There, they've decided that homeopathy is nothing. It's placebo. Uh, I don't know how it is in the veterinary literature, but, um, mm -hmm. but internationally and in, in some of the online journals, uh, it's easier to publish these things. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you for sharing, uh, Tim. We really appreciate it, and hopefully, uh, we'll be able to get you back to talk about some of the other remedies that you've worked on. Um, how often are they updated? You mentioned updating the monograph, and I'm wondering. Well, it's been 10 years, and just in the last year, they've added the like 27 monographs or something like that. And I think what's going to happen is now uh, they're going to be added regularly. Now, how regularly? You know, who knows? I mean, Andre's been promising us his uh, <laughs> his uh, epidemics book and his uh, Lipe book for. Uh, I mean. Yeah. Decade, decade. At least six years, seven years. He's been promised. Yeah. Oh, this year. But I mean, this is actually in Reference Works now. I can. Uh, let me show you. It's uh, uh, right here. Let's look yeah. under books. I mean, you mentioned under up. Um, Materia Medica Group Review. Here's all the remedies here. You see, Ferrum Foss is right here. The monograph I just showed you. It's there. It's it's in Reference Works now, and they're gonna just keep adding. So I mean, it's happening. Also, the repertory. Um, Unfortunately, the Materia Medica Pura repertory, MMPP repertory, the uh, complete, you have to have access to complete 4.5, which means you must have bought it a while back. If you buy the program now, and I have this problem with students, I use my this repertory all the time in class and clinic. It's a wonderful repertory. It's not available to students now, younger people getting into homeopathy, because they, the, the person in charge of the that owns the complete repertory, Roger Van Zandvoort. Will not allow the complete for uh, complete repertory 4.5 to be sold anymore. Right. Um, right. But I believe that uh, Synergy is now developing a new repertory based on yes. Kent and other repertories, and then adding all of the MMPP editions. When that repertory will be available, I don't know. I mean, I keep yeah. hearing that. Oh yeah, it's it's coming, it's coming. But mm. yeah, it will it will eventually be released. When I, you know, I don't know. Yep. But that'll be a great boon. That'll be, uh, I'll switch over to that repertory for sure. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, thank you all once again for, for coming. Uh, let me just check one last time, make sure there are no other comments, questions. Nope. So we'll see you next month. And thank you again for, for attending and especially, um, Dr. Fior, thank you for presenting to us, and we will see you next month. All right, Jeff, thank you. And you'll send me right. the uh, recording, right? I will. Yep, it thank will you. be. Uh, All right. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.